Sade lay awake listening for the telephone. Surely Papa would ring if he could. Was he too ill? Or were the hospital tests a cover-up? What better time to get rid of him while everyone was busy with Christmas? But both Aunt Gracie and Uncle Roy said the government would not risk doing something underhand while Papa was still in the news. Of course! Why had she not thought of it before? The news people could find out where Papa was. She jolted up and switched on her desk lamp to search for the paper with the address of the television studio. Mrs Howe had added the telephone number underneath. She could ring and ask for the newsroom. It was very late, but Papa had sometimes worked on his news all night. With luck, someone would be there. The landing was dark, with no beam of light underneath. Aunt Gracie and Uncle Roy's door. Sade crept downstairs by clutching onto the banister. The streetlight glowed eerily through the ruffles of net that veiled the window beside the front door. By shifting the telephone nearer, she could just make out its buttons. As she propped up the paper with the number on the window ledge, the clock in the hallway began to chime. She waited, counting. Twelve. The echo of the final chime covered the pips as she dialed. Holding the mouthpiece close, she asked for the newsroom. Once again, she listened to the ringing. It kept on ringing. Perhaps no one was there after all. They must have gone home. It was Christmas Eve now. Sade was on the point of giving up when a woman answered, her voice flat and brisk. It seemed to pick up a little interest. However, when Sade said who she was and why she was ringing. Curled back in bed, in the shadows of her room, doubts began to rise. Even if the reporter found out where Papa was being held, that would not stop him from being sent off into the waiting arms of the brass buttons and their soldiers. Caught halfway between sleep and wakefulness, Sade could not stop her mind zigzagging. Pictures from the past mingled crazily with thoughts of what might happen. She remembered the night on the aeroplane, peering out to see their home and all of Lagos disappear into a scattering of pinprick lights in the vast darkness. She remembered her feeling then of spinning out into space, adrift. How much older she felt now than the Sade of six weeks ago. So much had been frightening, yet somehow she and Femi were still here. Even if her brother kept his misery wrapped up like a hand grenade, at least they were still together. All they needed now was for pa Papa to be well again and to be allowed to stay with them. Was that too much to ask for? Mama had always said nothing was too much or too little to pray for. But Mama had believed in miracles. Sade was woken by Uncle Roy rumbling onto the landing. Someone was knocking at the front door. Who on earth? Seven o'clock? On a Sunday morning? Sade threw off her quilt. A sixth sense propelled her out of bed. Aunt Gracie, fastening her dressing gown, joined Sade at the top of the stairs. Femi too came shuffling out of his bedroom in time to see Uncle Roy unbolt the door. A whirlwind followed. Uncle Roy's deep roar of delight swept upstairs with the open blast of frosty air. Sade and Femi tumbled headlong downstairs. Papa, frail and supported by Uncle Deli's arm, stood smiling in the doorway. Take care! Uncle Deli pitched out his free hand to stop the children bowling Papa over. Swiftly they wriggled as close as possible to their father. Lean on me, Papa, Femi urged. With Uncle Deli's help, they escorted Papa to the sitting room. After the first flurries of greetings, Papa 
unraveled his tail. The doctor had become worried about pains in his chest and wanted him to have tests in hospital. It would be difficult to get them done on a weekend just before Christmas, but the doctor had gone away to see what he could arrange. The prison officers, however, seemed more worried that other detainees might riot if anything happened to Papa. They had moved him to another wing of the prison, where he was on his own. When he overheard talk about taking him to another prison altogether, he had rung Uncle Delhi, who in turn rang Mr Nathan. But his office is closed, Sade interrupted. He gave me his home number. For emergencies, explained Uncle Delhi. Mr Nathan had acted straight away. Somehow he had managed to speak to a member of parliament who spoke to the Home Secretary himself. Within hours, Papa was taken to a hospital in Oxford and the Home Secretary ordered that he should be set free. Papa could live in England for six months while they decided whether to let the family stay or send them away. When the hospital said that the tests could only be done after Christmas, Papa had discharged himself. I told them that you children would be my best medicine. Papa stroked their heads. Your mama always said I was a bad patient, but perhaps she would forgive me this time. He fell quiet. Shadi had never seen their father look so tired. She watched him take small sips of tea. Mama had often reminded him to slow down when he gulped his food in a hurry to get back to his work. Yet today, even sipping seemed to take an effort. Uncle Delhi took up the story of how he had brought Papa back, to, back from Oxford to London at midnight. They had decided it was too late to disturb the kings. Sade smiled to herself. She might tell them later about her midnight call to the television newsroom. It's my fault we are so early, Papa apologised. I couldn't wait any longer. Aunt Gracie laughed and shook her head. Good folk get up with the sun, she reassured him. It's we who have become lazy. All these clouds in England, you see, they cover up the sun and we forget. Papa's brief chuckle touched Sade's memory of Papa of old. Uncle Delhi laughed as well, but then turned serious. Do you know, Sade and Femi, that you actually saved your papa? He gazed earnestly from one to the other. If you hadn't taken his story to those newspeople, there could have been a very different ending. Sade felt herself flush, and Femi's lips wavered into a little grin. Like for poor Mr. Galib, my teacher friend from Somalia? Papa's face and voice became subdued again. They sent him back last week. Almost certainly to prison. Such a brave man. Papa broke off, closing his eyes. May God help him, Aunt Gracie murmured, then brought the conversation back to Uncle Delhi's tribute. Roy and I have been wanting to tell you, Mr. Salaja, that we think you have two special children. They have gone through su such a great deal, you know, and they're bearing up. Very true. And it hasn't been easy, Uncle Roy's words rolled out into a silence that caught them all. Papa was the first to speak. There are some things I have been wanting to give you children. I brought them with me. He paused. From home. He signalled to Uncle Delhi to pass him a small holdall. He began rummaging down one side, then the other. Ah, here they are. With a flourish, he held up two pairs of red and black goalkeeper's gloves, one larger than the other. Femi's eyes followed like a cat riveted by butterflies. Papa handed them to him. Femi turned the gloves over to examine them, his eyes, eyebrows raised in pleasure. Mama bought them for you and me just before she died, Papa added quietly. 
In an instant, Femi's face crumpled and distorted in a battle against sobs and tears. He would have dashed from the room, but Papa's arm swooped around him and pulled him onto his lap, pushing aside the bag. Femi buried his head in Papa's chest. Although Shade felt her own eyes pricking slightly, she somehow knew that this time she was not going to cry. She seemed to have cried so many tears already in the past few weeks. Today, it was Femi's turn. She knelt next to Papa, waiting for her brother's sobs to subside. Aunt Gracie, Uncle Roy and Uncle Deli slipped quietly out of the room. She and Femi were alone with Papa for the first time since Uncle Tunde had left them together in Papa's study on the day Mama had died. That day, they were like three survivors clinging to each other, stranded on a tiny raft. Since then, they had been flung apart, thrown into so many dangerous rapids. Yet here they were, having finally reached the same shore. Perhaps in a few months, they were going to be pushed away again, but for the moment, it was enough that they were together again. Look in my bag, Sade. Papa's arms were still comforting Femi as he directed her to look for a white agbada. Her hands delved into lifted and she felt the weight of something inside, something solid and heavy. Suddenly, she felt light and fluttery, as if the little Christmas tree birds were alive inside her fingers, beating their tiny wings. She unwrapped the material. There, gleaming against the starched white cotton, lay her own ebony Iowo. Oh, Iowo was almost alive with her delicately patterned hair and serene, calm eyes. Shade's fingers nimbly unfolded the Agbada's matching trousers. It was indeed Oko, Iwo's own companion, with his narrow, high-boned cheeks and his eyes still so sorrowful. With Oko cup between her palms, she stretched to plant a swift kiss on Papa's ear. Then, one at a time, she placed Oko and Iwo on the mantelpiece between the Christmas cards. A puffy, flame-red bird perched on the shoulder of a snowman seemed to inspect the newcomers through its beady black eyes. It was as if Papa knew what she was thinking. We're not going to give up hope. Those rogues and thieves in our country won't be there forever. One day we shall go home. He spoke in that steady voice that Shade had always found so comforting. She nestled back close to Papa and Femi. Home. She still found it so difficult to say the word herself. She would have to learn. Now that Papa was with them, England might become their new home for a while. If they were allowed to stay. If Papa was to lecture in America, they might make a new home there. If they went to South America. If. If. Wherever they went, they would have to become like tortoises who carry their homes on their backs. She thought of Papa's brave tortoise and hoped that at least they would not have to meet any more leopards. Shade gazed at Oko and Iwo and the rich streaks of brown within their glowing ebony faces. She thought of her desk at home and the forest behind family house from where the wood came. She thought of grandma, grandma who had lost a daughter and whose grandchildren were now thousands of miles away. This Christmas, one whole branch of the family would be missing at family house. Shade suddenly knew what she had to do. Papa and Femi were dozing next to each other and she eased herself away cradling Iowo and Oko in her arms. She made her way carefully upstairs to her desk. 